Zara Courant and I'm from St Mary's College. Hi, I'm Iru Witana and I'm from Sacred Heart College. Hi, I'm Wayne Leilo and I'm also from Sacred Heart College. Leora, Eru and Wayne are going to check out three jobs in communication and the three branches of our defence forces. The forces protect our country and are a warfighting organisation that uses some of the most advanced technologies in the world. From $600 million warships to our brand new NH-90 European design state-of-the-art helicopter. Leora, Wayne and Eru will handle communications technology designed to keep our forces in touch. Morning team, welcome to Air Force Base for Nuapai. Defence Recruiting Organisation Recruiting Event Manager JJ Laybourne is going to put our students through some tests. Each year we have many thousands of applications to join the Defence Force. The Defence Force organise assessment days to sort out those applicants who have the right qualities they are looking for. We do have the introductory tests online uh, at defencecareers.mil.nz. Then they must pass the multi-stage fitness test. There's also an online guide for this too. Okay, remember it's slow to start off with. The multi-stage fitness test is a 20 metre shuttle run. Uh, this is to test their cardio fitness, followed by the press-ups, which we test their, um, their upper body strength. When you to max out, you need to be counting your press-ups. And I'll tell you if it's not one. And then there, we do the sit-up to do their ab test, which gives us an indication on how strong they are in their midriff. Yep, you're not doing it properly. Right, back to the classroom. So, time for our students to go their separate ways. Leora stays here at Whanua Pai, where Corporal Aaron Go is off to show her the job of a CIS technician in the Air Force. So, what's the job about? Uh, as a communication information systems technician, uh, we provide, pretty much we provide the link between two parties that need to communicate with each other. It's all about passing information, uh, text, pictures, um, and still voice, that's still important, <laughs> using um, lots of different mediums, so cables, the RF system, so radio frequencies, as well as satellites. It might be a communication system used on base, or it could be one that's used to talk to a pilot as far away as the States or Canada. First, Aaron takes Leora to Fanua Pai's communications hub. So what goes on here? Here's our Air Operations Communication Centre. So from this building, we conduct all the communications to our air operations, as well as aircraft operating in the local area. Nikki Logan is the senior operator here today. Good readable both ways on 5687 and 8974. So over here we have our general purpose network, or as we call it, the GPN. This is our um, Auckland Bay, and this is our Christchurch Bay. and So this is what we use to talk to all of our aircraft in the Air Force. The comm centre always knows what aircraft are where and is always listening out for pilots. And this is all part of it, the waiting game, so we're just listening out for aircraft and we're always listening. We listen from 6 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night and then we even do stuff out of hours. So if a search and rescue was to go up in the middle of the night, we have a call-out person. There's an opportunity to test a radio link. This is Warrior 01, this is Air Force Auckland. Have you good readable radio check? This is, <laughs> this is Warrior... Warrior 01. This, this is, is Warrior 01. This is Air Force Auckland. This is Air Force Auckland. Do you good readable? Have you good readable? Radio check. Radio check. Over. Over. As a corporal in the CIS trade, I am in charge of my section pretty much. So I manage the equipment as well as the people. And people look to their corporals as the subject matter experts in their field. So I have to keep myself up to date with my equipment, and know how it all works and the best way to use it so I can pass that knowledge on. Portable and powerful two-way radios have long been one of the simplest ways to stay in touch. So this is where you do all your programming and... Um... They can be used for voice communication or data and they will work anywhere. It's able to provide um, a plain as well as encrypted voice uh, transmissions using different antennas that would be packed away with our equipment. So to tune it, all you have to do is just give this thing a quick push and you'll hear the radio clicking away and that's it tuning the antenna. All right, so uh, my call sign will be uh, Wizard, you'll be Sabre. Okay. Okay. Sabre, this is Wizard, radio check, over. Wizard, this is Sabre. Over. Radio check, over. Very good. And that's our testing done. Cool. Satellite technology is used to provide fast broadband connections. It might be used to send maintenance support material to a deployment anywhere in the world or transmit information to aircraft. 
Today, the Air Force's brand new helicopter, the NH-90, has flown in so that all personnel on base can check it out. Leora gets the chance to meet the pilot, Mike Garrett, and climb aboard. So this is a brand new helicopter? Yep, this is the brand new NH-90, and this is our uh, replacement for the Iroquois. Aircraft we've had for about 45 to uh, 47 years. As you can see, it's a fair bit bigger, um, a lot more capable, faster, and it's a great machine to fly for us. So what sort of communications technology do you have in this thing? Communications, it's uh, pretty much all voice. Um, got a fair few options, though. We've got uh, the ability to talk to all civil agencies, so police, SAR, customs, all that sort of thing. Um, also got encrypted frequency hopping for army communications. What's really cool about this thing is that like everything you see in the movies is actually here. Like all the buttons and the wires and like the headphones you see everybody wearing, even the helmets. Sabre 1-1, one, one, uh, Warrior zero, 2 reading you 5x5 five five also. As a CIS technician, you get to use some of the world's best communication technologies. So you have to enjoy the challenge of learning about it. So, was lunchtime the favourite part of your job? <laughs> no, it's not like school. Yeah. So if not lunchtime, what is your favourite part? Uh, I reckon it's, well, for me personally, it's going away to school for two years. Oh, yeah. They sent me away um, full time, paid my papers, paid my salary, and I got to get a diploma. But there's also travel, um, you get to meet awesome people, yeah. and you know, it's a job that um, they will look after you. Well, Aaron's looking after his team, delivering a detailed brief for a training exercise where all three arms of the forces will be able to talk to each other. Our role in that is to provide uh, the equipment and the transmission medium so we can uh, communicate with all the people that we need to talk to. To be a good CIS technician, you need to be energetic, active, enthusiastic, and just willing to learn new things. I see it now. Yeah, not too bad, eh? With everything set up, it's time to check out what's inside the truck. So what's the difference between this radio here and the one we assembled earlier? Nothing. So when we're using it just in the battery mode, they were capable of uh, around uh, 20 watts. But when we put them in here, the, we're able to get a power output of 125 watts. Cool. Leora's done great. She's active, she's keen, and she's really interested in all our equipment and just finding out about what everything does. And she's got a great sense of humour. Warrior, this is... <laughs> Put it down, try it again. But the idea of radio, although it seems quite simple, it's just music coming from the stereo in your car, actually quite complicated. To be a CIS technician in the Air Force, you need to be at least 17 years old and meet fitness, citizenship and security requirements for this trait. You need to have normal colour vision and you need to have a minimum of 12 NCEA Level 2 credits in Maths, English and Science. Computer skills are beneficial and the Air Force pays for all training. So all good for Leora, now it's Edu Witana's turn. He's headed to the NZ Army camp at Linton to check out a similar communications job, a systems engineer. Hey there, welcome to Linton. Good to meet you. Lance Corporal Leon Hood is on hand to show him around. So what does this job involve? Oh, as a systems engineer, pretty much you're just uh, providing engineering uh, support for all of the Army's communication systems. So that can be anywhere from switches, routers, to satellite comms or radios. But before any new recruit to the services starts learning their trade, they have to do basic training. Keeping fit, functioning well in a team environment, and having the confidence to overcome obstacles is very much part of that basic training. For everyone who joins the Army, they are soldiers first, and their trade second. Set her off by the left. Double. Ba. Up, 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 up. Warrant Officer Carl Clarsen is in charge of training, and he's going to put Edu's fitness right on the line. For the, with the monkey bars, make sure you've got your weapon slung. It's on your back, OK? We don't want it on the front. It's one uh, hand over hand as you go across. It's in the centre bar as well. And then uh, all the way down, make sure at the far end, you grab the last bar, and you swing out. All right, time for you to give those a go. I'm ready. Cool. Let's go. That's the way. Good. Well, well done. Well done. Keep it going. Keep going. Good work. Well, as soldiers first and uh, needing to stay fit, uh, obviously we have to conduct a lot of PT. So um, within within just the normal unit, uh, we conduct PT four times a week, which can be anything from uh, 
run to a stores carry to a confidence course. Uh, well, the confidence course is just a series of roughly 25 obstacles uh, where you have to navigate um, using balance, uh, strength and coordination. You got it, you got it. Edu's doing formidably well, but the bars are as far as he's going. Good effort. Nice one. One more, one more. One more. One more. Get that foot onto that bar. You're trained as a soldier and you're trained in a trade, so you can expect a lot of variety in your career. At Linton, the Army are proud of their brand new school. Uh, this is the place where we run all of our courses for the information systems operators, systems engineers. For example, right here, we've got a communication systems operator course going on. Edu's joining a training session where the class are setting up a voice link through a satellite. So we have phones plugged in on this end, and it goes all through this fat cable here up to the satellite simulator and it comes out the other side to your one. Edu configures his computer to recognise one end of the circuit. And... Hello? Yes. Yeah, so it works. To make it as a systems engineer, you really have to apply yourself. There's a lot of uh, technical courses that you have to get through. Uh, the diploma in electrotechnology. You have to be a fast learner, I'd say. You have to be able to cope with stress. You have to be quite technically minded. Uh, some of the applications that we use are not all that straightforward. Nearby, the Army is out on exercise. All the communication systems, radio, satellite and cell have been set up to provide links back to base. Today we're going to go down and visit an exercise being run by the 2nd Logistics Battalion. And what we're going to do is take down a remote communications access node to add more capability. The remote communication access node is on board the truck. It uses New Zealand's 3G cell network to hook computers at the exercise back to the central control in base. So over here, uh, we're coming to the forward communications access node. This is the part owned by the Signals Regiment. I'll take you in and see the CP. So what does CP stand for? Oh, yeah, so CP stands for Command Post, which is where we are now. So if you see over here, this is the exercise commander. He's currently creating some overlays for the mapping software. And here we have the exercise 2IC, who's currently sorting out all of that administration and ordering for the exercise. So you're not just restricted to your vehicle? Uh, no, no. So in this, um, in this installation, we've just chucked a tent on the side of the vehicle. But uh, the vehicle can actually be anywhere up to 200 metres away from the CP itself, because we just remote uh, the network in via fibre. The additional gear they trucked in is now wired to the command post. Sweet, so we confirm that the network is working. The link is configured and is now working well. Yeah, sweet man, so we got the commander. Nice work. As a systems engineer, you might set up communications anywhere. Some of the locations will be testing. Uh, well, we work in some pretty harsh terrain. Uh, within New Zealand, the harshest terrains we deploy to uh, Tikapo down south and Waiuru in the North Island, uh, where we can quite often have to deal with snow. Uh, overseas, uh, some, of, some of the more rough terrains that you can find yourself working in are East Timor, where it's quite tropical, or uh, Afghanistan, where it's a desert environment. What do you enjoy about the job? Uh, well, I'd say uh, the best thing about the job is really just all of the, the diversity that you get. I mean, every morning when you put on the uniform, like, you, you don't know exactly what you're going to do, whether you're going to be um, just uh, engineering a new system or you're going to be uh, supporting another exercise like we are here. What have you enjoyed most so far? Well, the highlight of my career so far was in 2011, where I was deployed to East Timor. It was just really good, you know, finally putting all that training into practice. All those years that I spent in Waiuru and uh, down in Wellington, um, finally just doing the job real time. So, could Edu do the job real time too? Uh, yeah, well, I think Edu's done pretty well. Uh, I've seen some good fitness from him, I've seen a lot of a lot of good work ethic, and uh, yeah, he'd make a good addition to the team, I think. Oh, it's been a great couple of days down at a Linton Army base. Huge experience. Um, definitely worthwhile. To be a systems engineer in the Army, you need to be at least 17 years old and meet fitness, citizenship and security requirements for this trade. You need to have normal colour vision and you need to have a minimum of 12 NCEA Level 2 credits in Maths, English and Physics. Computer skills are beneficial. The Army pays for all training. So all good for Leora and Edu, now it's Wayne's turn. He's headed to the Devonport Naval Base, Philomel, 
to check out what's different about a communications job in the Navy. Petty Officer Radio Signals Mark Nash Mark, is on hand to show it. The Royal yeah. New Zealand Navy provides border security and resource protection around New Zealand, as well as military protection globally. This could include anything from anti-piracy operations in the Arabian Gulf to high-end war fighting. Like the other services, secure, reliable and effective communication is what the job's all about. Comms is our job, communications is what we do, and these ships are, are what we do it on. These are where you'll spend most of your time. You'll get to spend time at sea on them, enjoy that. And like the other services, basic training is where the job will start. First Wayne heads to the damage control school where he learns he's going to get wet. This facility simulates a ship that floods, water pouring in as if at sea. Great tool, it rocks like a ship, so you get the water motion once it gets a little bit deeper, uh, and they can fill it pretty quickly when they want to, yeah. Wayne gets a brief and then a dry run on what he's got to do. Okay, so what's going to happen uh, when we come in with the water? Uh, this hole here will, uh, I guess, start flooding. Water will be pouring out of it. People will come down the ladder. The first people that come down the ladder will just throw themselves on that. Um, that's just to try and slow the water down a little bit. Um, they'll just lie there until uh, someone from up top comes down with a splinter box, and which time that'll be put over there. Once that's over there, then we'll get someone to uh, stand on it, sit on it, do whatever they can to keep it in place. A post is used to jam the splinter box against the roof. When it's wedged, the flooding will be checked. Flood, 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 flood in the next bit, flood in the next bit. Now it's time for Wayne to get cold and wet. If your ship is punctured in some way beneath the waterline, it's crucial you stop that water flow. You do learn the seriousness of the, of the situation when you're carrying out that training. If you're not working as a team when you're trying to stop floods or put out fires, things just become a lot harder than they should be. Particularly with the flooding, when you're trying to hold uh, the splinter boxes, the big metal boxes on the floor. If you've got two people that aren't working together, it's not going to stay down there. It'll lift itself up with the pressure and drift away. So, how would you like that? It was exciting. Big rush. The training is very varied. Like the other services, learning about computer networks plays its part. Along with learning how you assist navigation of a ship in the bridge simulator. Signal is awaiting execution from the OCS to starboard, 90 degrees to a new course of 270. The Navy spent a lot of time travelling the world and it's essential that they, like the Air Force and the Army, use sophisticated technology to communicate back to New Zealand and other world militaries. All ships, this is OCS, execute to follow, turn starboard 9, over. What makes them different is that they're able to use alternative communication methods such as flags and flashing light when they need to go into stealth mode and maintain radio and satellite silence. One of the other things you'll learn very early on is Morse code. Uh, we send Morse code by flashing light. Wayne's exercise will be to flash a message um, to another flag staff team. So then they flash it. So yep, second one. So you want to have less pause between the two things. You want to go dit, da. Uh... Oh, yeah. They in turn will hoist the flags to display his message. Alpha Delta 41, well done, Wayne. Well, the advantage of the job, um, the pay's good. You've got free medical, you've got free dental, you get a uniform provided to you, you don't have to, you know, find your own work clothes. And you get to go to sea. In the very early morning, Wayne climbs aboard a Navy rib and heads out for a very special visit. I love being at sea. Um, I love the pressure that comes with this job. There's certain situations where things have to be done at high speeds and you're working in quite high intensity, high pressure environments. Um, you've got people that are getting on your back to get things done and I, I love that feeling of getting it done as fast as you can and making, you know, making the people that you're providing the service for happy. Oh, that was great. It's not every day you just climb the side of a ship, you know? Wayne's climbed aboard one of the Navy's frigates, Te Mana, which is exercising in the Hauraki Gulf. Um, offices and just like general workspaces on that side. In this side you've got your engine rooms, so GT space, well that's the diesels and this is the GT in here. Gas turbine, the thing that makes you go fast. So average day on board a ship at sea, uh, well you'll generally be in watches, so you'll probably find that you've been up at some point during the night, in which case you may get a little sleep in. If not, you'll get up at 8 o'clock and carry out cleaning stations as per normal. One of the more important jobs is to man the incident message board. See, closed up. HQ1, Forward DC, Fire and 3 Echoes of the 1 has been overhauled. So what we're coming to now is um, Forward Damage Control or Forward DC. Um, you may be required to come in here as 
an incident board operator. Um, this would be the incident board that you'd be working on. Uh, In the event of an incident such as fire, all actions are logged so there's a clear record of what takes place. But there are no incidents this morning. Demana is on exercise, practicing close quarters manoeuvring with Endeavour while maintaining radio silence. So what's the overall purpose of the exercise? So what we're doing at the moment is uh, called Officer of the Watch manoeuvres. Um, it exercises the bridge team in uh, manoeuvring ships in close quarters. Uh, um, at the moment we're doing it by flag hoist. The flags on board Demana indicate the planned heading or direction of the ship. Once the message is confirmed by Endeavour, the heading can be changed. Seems a bit old-fashioned, so uh, what's the benefit? So, in, in times of uh, war, uh, ships can use different equipment to like pick up where other ships are by radio transmission. Ships can maintain two bearings and distances from the guide on completion of the manoeuvre. So flags and uh, flashing light as well. Can't be tracked by day. If you join the Navy as a communications warfare specialist, you can end up anywhere. There's opportunities to commission from the ranks and become an officer. Um, and once you head up, head up round uh, Chief and Warrant, it becomes quite normal to commission uh, into the officer world. It's pretty exciting being at sea. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, your day's never really the same. It kind of always changes. And uh, yeah, you find yourself doing things like this on a day-to-day -day basis. There's, yeah, there's all sorts. There's, there's just your days don't say the same too often, it's, it's good. And it's been very good for Wayne. So good, he's presented with a gold coin. A token to remember a couple of days he certainly won't forget. I'd love to join the Navy. I mean, the training, it's, it's really fun. Um, the people here, they're really nice. They took care of me, everyone, Mark especially. So Leora, Edu and Wayne have all thoroughly enjoyed their time with the forces. They've all learnt where communications are concerned, the sky's the limit. And who you can talk to is two. Army One, Air Force One, this is Temana. I'm connecting you to Operations Room for Navy Gunfire Support. Out. Warship Temana, this is Army One, send over. Army One, stand by. Force One, this is Temana, over. Warship Temana, this is Air Force One, go ahead, over. Army One. Air Force One, this is Temana. I'm connecting you to the operations room for the Navy gunfire support. The three forces are connected. The joint exercise can begin. To be a Naval Communications Warfare Specialist, you need to be at least 17 years old and meet fitness, citizenship and security requirements for this trade. You need to have normal colour vision and a minimum of 12 NCEA Level 1 credits in Maths and English. It is also desirable to have a minimum of 12 NCEA Level 1 credits in a science subject. The Navy pays for all training. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand On Air.